I would be typing what you will find yourself. Close. Julia and I talked such shit during. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Let's go ahead and continue. We're going to pick up where we left off, uh, and I'm going to try to be as efficient as possible so that we can get through everything. Uh, in the uh, required amount of time using the working backwards strategy. I'm thinking about where we want to be, which is 1215, uh, and imagining trying to get through all of these slides between now and then. So let's talk about representation. We got a little bit more to do on this problem solving, and then we're going to switch gears and talk about uh, insight and creativity. Um, for representation, uh, this is just another example uh, of the problem of representation. Uh, now, we talked about the birds and trains example as one in which a representation focused on the bird makes it hard to solve, and a representation focused on the trains and the time and the distance makes it easy to solve. The monk problem is one that is essentially impossible to solve uh, unless you uh, choose a different representation. And I'll show you why in just a minute. So uh, the problem is uh, stated like this. So the monk leaves the monastery at 6 o'clock in the morning, 6 a.m., and gets to a mountaintop by four. Uh, so you can sort of imagine this trajectory. The next day, he leaves the mountaintop at six and gets back home at four. Uh, he travels at a very irregular pace and stops often. So sometimes fast, sometimes slow, taking breaks, uh, and those things are not uh, indicated. Is there a time when he is exactly at the same spot at the same time of day on day one as on day two. Uh, when presented, when uh, participants are usually presented with a problem like this, most participants find this to be an unsolvable problem. Uh, and the reason it seems unsolvable is that there are too many uh, unknowns, right? He travels at an irregular pace. We don't know how long it is uh, from the uh, monastery to the mountaintop. Uh, we don't know how often he stops and how many times he stops on day one and day two. Uh, a second thing that seems to be difficult when people are trying to solve a problem like this uh, is that many uh, participants misinterpret this as what time of day or where on the mountaintop. The question is, uh, is there a time, not what time, but is there a time when he is exactly, he is in exactly the same spot at the same time on day one as on day two? So most of you, many of you, if you read through the textbook, you probably read that there's an answer for this. Uh, and if you read through the text, even if you didn't read through the textbook, you may assume that there's an answer for this, because otherwise I wouldn't be using this example to just say, hey, here's a problem you can't solve. Uh, the alternative seems to be rather than uh, think about how fast, ignore the information about how fast and how irregular, uh, and think about the representation uh, instead. So rather than the verbal representation, an alternative might be a visual representation. Here is a hypothetical uh, time altitude uh, distance plot of our monk. This is hypothetical because he travels at an irregular pace and he stops often. So here is the base, here is the mountaintop, here is time of day from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. And let's imagine that through the course of the day, he climbs the mountain in this way. Right, so that's day one travel. So how many of you can sort of see what's coming on day two so that you can see the answer to this problem? Not only is there a time, but there has to be a time. Uh, there's no alternative. There has to be a time where he's in exactly the same spot at the same time of the day, because if we can imagine on day two, a time altitude plot uh, where the monk starts at the monastery at the top and then descends uh, to the mon starts the peak at the top and descends uh, to the monastery at the base of the mountain. Uh, there's his altitude at the top. There's the time of the day, 6 a.m., 4 p.m. It's impossible not to cross these two paths, right? This is in simple X, Y space. If you imagine here to here one day and here to here the next day, it wouldn't matter how fast. It wouldn't matter how irregular. Uh, it wouldn't matter if uh, he stays at the top and then falls eventually those lines are gonna cross, right? Those lines have to intersect somewhere, which by definition is the same time and the same location on the path. Uh, and so this is an example of choosing the appropriate representation. The verbal 
representation or the propositional representation uh, makes it very difficult to solve a problem like this. A visual interpretation makes it a lot easier to solve a problem like this. A few more examples, uh, and uh, then we'll move on. So this is one you're familiar with. You're probably all familiar with this. If you took my cognitive psychology class, we talked about this. You probably talked about this in Psych 1000. So we're going to go through this one really quickly. It's also highlighted in the textbook. This is a classic insight problem, and this is Dunker's candle box problem. And this is a problem that, uh, although it seems really straightforward now, um, when originally presented to subjects, most people didn't solve it. Uh, but it also highlights the kinds of problems that many of us find ourselves facing on a regular basis, which is how do we fix something uh, to work the way that we want it to? Uh, how do we solve something when we're not exactly sure how to solve it? Uh, how do we fix, uh, you know, how do you configure your laptop or your phone to work in a particular way when you're not really sure how to do it? How do you get a shortcut uh, to do something? Dunker's candle box problem offers a solution. So two conditions. Uh, in Dunker's original uh, uh, configuration of this problem, there was a, what he called the control condition and the functional fixed condition. In the control condition, you get uh, a problem. Candles are to be mounted to light a room. So you're in a dark room, you've got some equipment, and you've got to find a way to make, to mount the candles so that they illuminate the entire room, right? Uh, shouldn't be difficult. Uh, if you had a shelf, you could just put the candle on a shelf. But suppose this is a shelfless room right? Uh, so your job is to figure out the best way to mount the candles. And you have candles, some tacks, maybe some matches, and some empty boxes. That's a control condition. All of the objects are separate. Most subjects can solve this problem. Uh, in the functional fixedness problem, and this is what he was getting at, is that sometimes the function of an object uh, or the role of an object is constrained by what you see it doing now. And in this case, the boxes contain, so you have a box of candles or a box of matches or a box of tacks, uh, as it's shown on the next slide. So the solution in this particular case, in Dunker's original uh, example, uh, was to take the tacks, tack the box to the wall, uh, and then put the candle in the little box so that it makes a little tiny shelf for you. Not very safe, uh, and I wouldn't recommend this, uh, to illuminate anything. The candle was too close to the wall, by the way. Uh, it'll probably catch the wall on fire. Uh, and also, this doesn't seem very stable. It's a cardboard box, so it's going to start tipping down, and the wax is going to drip on the carpet. Have you ever had wax on a carpet? Bad. But the point is, this is a solution that's available uh, and that most participants in the control condition can arrive at. But conditions in the function, uh, subjects in the functional fixedness condition, most of them didn't solve it. And the reason uh, is that the box was already doing something. The box wasn't a, a tool. The box was holding the tax. And so most participants didn't see it as a possible mechanism, as a possible given. Uh, it was doing something else. And that's a problem that I think a lot of us have. We find ourselves in a rut where we're doing one thing uh, and we're unable to sort of shift over uh, to a different approach. Uh, this can be seen from another example, the laser tumor problem. Uh, we're getting to the end of the first lecture, I promise. Uh, a patient has an inoperable tumor. A doctor can use lasers to destroy the tumor, but the problem is that at the intensity needed to destroy the tumor, the lasers will destroy good tissue as well. As well. How can the doctor destroy the tumor without destroying any good tissue? So we see the givens and the initial state. The initial state is tumor, bad, uh, lasers, which we can use to destroy them. And the goal state is we want to destroy the tumor with the lasers, but we don't want to destroy any, we don't want to burn through any good tissue as well. Uh, when Jick and Holio presented their participants with this, only about 10% on the first pass were able to solve this problem. The solution that most people eventually arrive at when they arrive at the solution, uh, and most of you probably already have this solution in mind, uh, is that you would uh, arrange many lasers at a low intensity so that when they intersect, they intersect at high full intensity right at the point of the tumor. But each one of these is too low to do any real damage, but when they sum together at the tumor, they have enough intensity to destroy the tumor. So the only time, lasers are very small beams, right? So the only time they can destroy tissue is when they intersect. If you do it just right, you can destroy that tissue. You could probably see this problem 
uh, in other ways where you may not have uh, the, the wherewithal to do something now, but if you do it in small components or small increments, uh, you're able to solve the problem uh, appropriately. In uh, Jick and Holyoke's original experiment, they also were interested in whether or not people could use analogies to solve the problem. And so subjects who were just given the problem, only 10% were able to solve it. Uh, but they have two additional conditions they're interested in. One condition is, uh, if we give you some, if we give you a cover story, are you able to use this cover story to help you arrive at the insight? In this case, it's not a direct one-to-one -one match. There's no surface structure overlap between this story and the laser tumor problem, but there's an underlying uh, deep structure. And you can see what it is. Contrary is ruled from the strong fortress by a dictator. The fortress was situated in the middle of the countryside, surrounded by farms and villages. Uh, many roads led to the fortress through the countryside. A rebel general vowed to capture the fortress. The general knew that an attack by his entire army could capture the fortress. He gathered his army at the head of one of the roads, ready to launch a full-scale attack. So subjects, if they were told to use this as a hint, could imagine that this was a proxy or an analogy for the laser, and this was the tumor. Does that make sense? Uh, and so we won't take the time to read through all of this in class. You can read this. It's in the textbook as well. Um, but the solution is, the problem is that uh, if the whole army marches, uh, it'll detonate some landmines on any one of those roads and destroy the entire country, uh, destroy the army, but also destroy the village. Um, the solution was then to divide the army into small little forces that can pass on the road uh, undetected, and they'll all arrive at the same time right where they need to be. Uh, so if the entire army gets it right, little tiny forces traveling, not going to cause any alerts, but they're all going to arrive at the fortress at the same time, reassemble, and then take over the fortress. And that's exactly uh, the problem that would be solved with the laser tumor problem. So in Jick and Holyoke's uh, study, um, when they're presented with this, uh, if each person read the story of the general and some, an additional group was told that it was a hint, 10% um, solved without the story, 30% uh, solved if so only 30% of the individuals not told to notice the analogy solve the problem. Sorry, this is worded in a way that's not very clear. And 75% of the subjects who were given the problem and told that it had a hint uh, were able to solve the problem correctly. So knowing using an analogy helps. Knowing how to use the analogy helps you to restrict the problem space. What you probably noticed about a lot of these problems, uh, both the, certainly the monk uh, problem is one example of this. Uh, the laser tumor problem is another example, is that a lot of these have some degree of insight. Uh, there's some point at which they might seem unsolvable. It might seem difficult to solve. And once you realize what the solution is, then you kind of feel a little sense of relief, like, ah, that's so obvious. If you play Wordle, or especially connections, sometimes you get that little feeling of insight, right? Where you think like, ah, oh, yeah, that's, I get it. Now it's one of these things. Uh, and with the monk problem, maybe you thought, oh, I get it. Yes, obviously they have to cross. And that's when uh, they're at the same place at the same time. And in the laser tumor problem, an example of an insight problem where sometimes it helps to have uh, some distance or to have an analogy or to have some other way to approach the problem. And with insight problems, most people feel or express or self-report that they feel some degree of sort of a sense of relief or satisfaction, like a physiological uh, feeling, uh, sort of a, a, a feeling of relief that some sort of blockage uh, was overcome. That's an example of an insight problem. So that would have been the end of that slideshow. And let's move on to the next slideshow. Do we have this slide? Um, someone asks, do we have this slide? Um, it's possible that there are some slides missing from this first one. You probably noticed actually in your own slides that some of the slides with the solutions <laughs> were missing. Uh, and the reason is that if I'm using them as examples, sometimes it's nice to not have the solution, uh, but you do have the uh, problem uh, itself. If you're interested in having the solution examples, I'll upload those later uh, as the slides to study from. So let's talk about insight and creativity. This is gonna pick up exactly where we should have started uh, about 20 minutes ago. So 
we're going to hide the floating meaning controls. And this is the second half of my lecture um, where we just uh, started off here. So let's talk about insight a bit. I'm going to take you into a little bit more detail on the process, the psychological process of insight uh, and uncovering insight and what most people would say uh, when they're in a problem that requires some degree of insight. This is also going to give you some insights, no pun intended, uh, into the different kinds of structures that you might that might you might find helpful. Uh, so this particular experiment has two things to it. One is uh, transcripts of people trying to solve the problem and arriving at an insight, uh, and also several degrees of hints that you might get to show what kinds of hints help to nourish the insights. So this builds on sort of that Jick and Holyoke idea, but we're going to get into a little bit more detail here. From here, we're going to switch to creativity uh, and then finish out uh, the lecture. So this is a study from Herbert Simon's work, In Search of Insight. Uh, in this experiment, what they're going to do is they're going to ask participants to solve a particular problem known as the mutilated checkerboard problem, which sounds kind of disgusting. Uh, but a mutilated checkerboard just means a chessboard or a checkerboard that's missing some pieces. Uh, so it's not a full checkerboard. And they're going to have to solve a particular problem. And we're going to give them several configurations. And then we're going to ask them uh, to sort of think out loud while they're solving the problem so that we can identify the moment of insight. Uh, here is the mutilated checkerboard problem. In the mutilated checkerboard problem, we're told uh, to imagine a standard checkerboard. The mutilated checkerboard has somewhat of a reputation, both of an insight puzzle problem and as a challenge to puzzle solving problems in AI. The difficulty stems from the fact that the initial representation, the problem solver almost always fails to solve the problem. So in its standard representation, it seems impossible. Uh, and we'll see why in just a minute. Subjects need to change their representation, representation in a non-obvious way. This problem falls outside the limits of standard information processing theory of problem solving. The classic problem is this. It plays an eight by eight checkerboard, two of whose diagonally opposite corners have been removed. So if you've played chess or checkers or anything else, or even if you haven't, you can see this checkerboard. Here it is, uh, eight by eight, and then you take away two, right? Uh, so that means that you have 62 squares. Eight by eight is 64. You take away two. You have an even number, 62, because you've moved the two diagonals. Then subjects are told to imagine placing dominoes. You all know what dominoes are, right? Not the pizza, but dominoes, the game piece. Uh, and they are game pieces that are rectangular with essentially two squares. So if you placed a domino on top of a checkerboard, it would cover two squares. Does that make sense? And it would cover them two horizontally or vertically, but not diagonally. So imagine placing dominoes on the board so that one domino covers two horizontal or vertically, but not diagonally adjacent squares. The problem is to show how two, how 31 dominoes would cover the remaining squares, which mathematically sounds like it could, right? Because 31 and 31 is 62. Or to prove logically, using some kind of deduction, that a complete covering is impossible. If you have never seen this problem before, you might want to try it now before reading the solution. Let's just move on from that because I can show you the solution. Um, since the 31 dominoes cover two squares, covering initially seems possible. To see why a complete covering is actually impossible, I just gave you the answer, it's impossible. Observe that a domino must always cover a white and black square, right? Because everything is white and black. If you've removed two whites and everything has to cover a white and black square, you now have two configurations of dominoes that have nowhere to go. It's impossible if you have to always cover white and black. That's the insight, by the way. Uh, you now, after covering 30 white and 30 uh, dominoes, you won't be able to do it. So because we wished all subjects to solve the problem, hints were given periodically to subjects if and when they failed to make process. There were four types of hints given. One hint tells them that it is impossible, and their job is to show how. That's a hint. That's an impossible hint. Another hint uh, is the insight hint. A generally impossible hint, and the insight hint suggested there was a trick that didn't involve exhausted covering. So you might tell them, maybe it seems like you're, you're not getting there, but try to think about it in a different way. There's a trick. There's a trick to this question. Um, another hint is the parity hint, and that's a really crucial one. In other words, 
dominoes have to cover things in pairs. And once you realize that, that's when the inside usually comes, right? Uh, because you have to cover a white and a black in pairs, and now you're missing two halves. That means you're gonna left, be left over, two dominoes left over. Uh, and the count, uh, the count uh, hint is uh, count the number of blacks and pinks. They have black and pink in this case. And they were also four different kinds of conditions. So subjects were given a blank uh, square. That's a really difficult one to solve because coming up with the parity uh, or the color uh, combination is gonna be hard, right? Because now you're missing two diagonals. Although it's still impossible, it seems less impossible because uh, you no longer have that hint available. Here's your standard color board. Uh, here's the black and pink labeled with the words black and pink, uh, which could be easier because now you know that you've got two actual blacks missing. Uh, and here's one that sort of arrives at the uh, hint by showing them a color board to imagine rather than black and pink, to imagine bread and butter. Uh, and this one lets people solve it maybe a little bit more quickly because if you're trying to cover a bread and a butter and you're now missing two butters, you don't have enough bread left over. Does that make sense? Uh, so these are four different conditions and four different hints. And what they're really interested in is how fast do people solve them in these different conditions? Because some of them allow the insight to come more naturally. And what do they say while they're solving them? Subject number one, a bread and butter subject. Uh, this is what they say. The, the, this is a 70 second excerpt. Just by trial and error, I can find 31 places. I don't know, maybe someone else would have counted space and said it could fit 31, but if you try, you can only fit 30. Keep trying. Maybe it has to do with the words on the page. I haven't tried anything with that. Maybe that's it. Okay, dominoes can fit. Dominoes can fit over two squares, no matter which way you put it. It cannot go diagonally. It has to fit over a butter and a bread. And because you crossed over two breads, it leaves two butters. So it doesn't, 30 won't fit. Is that the answer? This subject solves it pretty quickly. A color subject. Um, again, they arrive at the insight. There's two black squares covered up. Since you always have to cover a black and a pink, there's no way you can do it. A color subject requiring a hint. What about color? That's the experimenter. Can you use color to help you out? There's two pinks next to each other. Oh God, you're taking two blacks away and you would need to take a black and a white out, a black and a pink. So you're leaving out, oh, he gets all excited here. Uh, you're leaving, it's short, how many? And he gets kind of excited because he's finally figured out the problem to solve that he hasn't solved. So the in search of insight here is what conditions allow insight to arrive and how do participants experience the insight when they get it? This shows the number of approaches. Uh, and you can see that blank takes longer. Blank takes longer because the insight is harder and more abstract. Uh, if everything is the same, if there's no black, there's no pink, there's no bread and butter, there's no different colors, arriving at the insight that you need to have these horizontal and diagonal pairs takes a lot more time. And so it takes them longer uh, to solve takes them longer to declare it's impossible, takes them longer to mention the idea of parity, takes them longer to find uh, a rough proof. Uh, when they're given color, uh, they're doing it a little bit faster. And the bread and butter, which makes this parity issue uh, seem very clear, that one slice of bread has a bread and a butter on it, uh, it becomes more difficult to solve. It becomes easier to solve this problem. People can recognize the impossibility more quickly. Everybody's looking at the clock, wondering, is Dr. Minda going to make it? Um, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to do my best here. Uh, so does that seem straightforward to everybody? Uh, insight involves uh, being able to come up with something that does not seem obvious. Uh, come up with a new way to represent the problem, but in such a way that you actually get a little bit excited or kind of relieved that you were able to solve the problem. This leads kind of nicely into uh, creativity. So I want to define and describe creativity. Most of this is in the textbook uh, within the problem solving chapter. Uh, so I do not have a separate chapter on problem solving I or on creativity. I have some of this content uh, in the um, uh, in the cre in the problem solving chapter. So let's talk first about some stages of creativity, uh, and then we're going to talk about what how to encourage creativity, and how to describe creativity. These should strike you as roughly the same as the stages of problem solving, because the idea of problem solving and creativity share some common uh, threads. So preparation and incubation, um, illumination and verification. Uh, these are roughly the same stages. Uh, the only difference here is that we've kind of broken down that middle stage. 
creativity usually involves some kind of insight or some kind of moving ahead, moving something forward from where it would otherwise be. Uh, and this might be this insight, the creative idea arrives suddenly into conscious uh, awareness. And when you're thinking creatively, uh, you're coming up with new solutions to problems or you're coming up with new approaches uh, to a decision. Uh, so you, you may be having some kind of an insight uh, as well. So with that in mind, we've got problem solving, but we're breaking it down into something that involves more insight, a little bit more uh, role for things like spreading activation and familiarity. Um, and that's where we can talk about these three aspects. So this might be what differentiates problem solving and insight problem solving from creativity in general. Um, these are three different concepts that I've given them S names here just to sort of make them easy to remember, uh, but sensitivity, synergy, and serendipity. All three of these seem to be important uh, in aspects of creative behavior, creative thinking, uh, creative problem solving. Uh, sensitivity uh, involves the kind of cognitive flexibility or sort of broader awareness of things that might not be immediately available. In the insight problem solving example, a sensitivity might be figuring out the parity issue easier when it's bread and butter, uh, a little bit less difficult or a little bit harder when it's not uh, labeled. Synergy might be taking two different ideas, two different fields and bringing them together in a new way. And serendipity just means the uh, awareness or sensitivity to the possibility that you might have an accidental discovery. Uh, if you're familiar with a domain uh, and you're studying or working in a domain, uh, and something happens by chance and you recognize the importance of that chance discovery, that might be described as a serendipitous uh, discovery. So sensitivity, uh, finding solutions and finding and defining new problems. If you are someone who works in a creative field or you're someone who scores high on measures of creativity, uh, you may have slightly broader attentional deployment. Maybe you are able to notice things outside of the uh, immediate path. Maybe there are alternative solution paths or alternative decision paths uh, that, are, that are less obvious, but a sensitive person uh, might be able to notice. Uh, the example that was given in the text uh, was um, for a sort of an AirBud or an AirPods, for example, uh, that are wired. How many of you know these little, have had one of these when you were a little kid? Uh, these little change purses that you could put coins in. Uh, you squeeze them and you put coins in them. In an era when few people carry around coins, but you still happen to see one of these things. Uh, this is my younger daughter was a lot younger, like four or six or something like that. Had no, didn't have any change, didn't have any coins to put in, had no idea what it was used for, and just said, "I guess it must be to keep the air the air buds from getting tangled." Uh, it kind of seems like that. So it might be noticing something that's not as obvious. The little hole on the end here was to design it so that you can squeeze it and it'll open up so that you can put things in it. Uh, but it also has the alternative uh, component of being able to allow the cord uh, to stretch out. So that might be something that's not immediately obvious, sensitive to an alternative uh, use. We'll come back to this when we talk about the alternative uses task, uh, which is a common task to measure creativity. Uh, another opportunity or, is the idea of synergy. And the one that most of us are most common uh, with, most familiar with and the most common uh, is the idea of the graphic user interface. Uh, it's common enough that all of you would have uh, been familiar with a GUI uh, interface for data entry uh, for as long as you've been familiar with the idea of data entry, which is if you have a device, if you have a laptop, an iPad, uh, or a, a smartphone, uh, you're used to putting things in by swiping or by typing uh, or by pointing and clicking. So you've got your uh, laptop there. You can use the track to point and click. You can drag things. And most of us are really familiar with this. One of the reasons it works so well is it feels really natural, right? If you're selecting something on a screen, it's the same motions that you would use to select something in real life and move it to the right. It's a direct one-to-one -one correspondence with a motor action. That seems so obvious now that it's hard to even think about uh, the alternative, uh, which was uh, 40 years ago or 50 years ago. This is 19, uh, this is actually from an encyclopedia from 1996, but this is actually 1981. Uh, so imagine working with a personal computer that is 
not only large, uh, black and white, but only has text. Uh, and so the only way to interact with it is to type word commands. Now, most of you do this sometimes, right? Uh, those of you that have worked with uh, Python or R probably got familiar with being able to uh, issue text commands at a prompt uh, and be able to ask your computer to do things. However, most of us like interacting with our uh, desktop or our laptop or our device uh, by moving things. Um, so this was the original sort of data entry uh, mechanism. And you can see that one of the things that's really obvious the kids are not using it. Uh, the adults are using it here. I don't know what they're doing, but suppose they're doing some sort of financial work for their family. The kids are absolutely not interested in the screen time at all back here. They're just having cereal. Uh, so no screen time, uh, not very much you can do with it. And in this particular case, this was a home computer, the TRS-80 uh, computer, which is the first one that I had. Um, it was so primitive that you had to type in the date uh, every time you used it, uh, because when you turned it off, it forgot everything. <laughs> uh, so there's no ability to know what it was. You had to actually tell it what date you thought it was. Uh, and that was me, by the way, uh, when I was 11 or 12, uh, sitting there uh, loading some sort of software off of one of these uh, computer, off of one of these uh, di floppy disks, they were called. So that's how you stored the data uh, into one of these, I think, in a school setting. Um, and so you'd have to keep them in a folder and you'd have to put them in uh, to load any kind of application. Uh, this is the only photo known photograph of me uh, from the 1980s interacting with a computer device. Not very much fun. Um, and you can see I wasn't really enjoying the company of others. Uh, I was sitting alone at a computing device uh, entering in um, some information. So. Most people didn't use computers in the 1980s because they were expensive and they weren't very much fun to use. All you could do was type in the date uh, and maybe work through some slow uh, programming. However, uh, most people are familiar instinctively or intuitively with how to work at a desk, right? This is a desk from the 1700s, uh, but you would know today how to use that desk, wouldn't you? If you sat down at a desk like this that was built several hundred years ago, you would know exactly what to do with it. You would put things that you need to work on on the desktop. And you would put things that you need often, but not every day, every time uh, in these little cubbies at the top. So these would be things that you would access a lot, pens or paper clips or small uh, notes for yourself. And you might put things that you need on a semi-regular basis here. And then you might store things that you rarely need down at the bottom, but with some kind of system so that you could find them whenever you needed them. You would probably do this instinctively, even if no one told you how to use the desk. And so it wasn't until the 1980s uh, at Xerox, um, Palo Alto Research Center, before Apple came on the scene, uh, that the insight was made to bring those two domains together. The natural intuitive experience of working at a table or a desk, which most people can do without being told, uh, and the idea of interacting with a virtual desktop. And so this particular operating system, uh, which precedes uh, the Apple operating system by quite a lot, um, took that idea. You've got inbox and an outbox. You've got pieces of paper to represent a file. Uh, most of us think of opening up files and you might see an icon that looks like uh, a piece of paper, but there's no reason it has to be that. All it is is a location in your computer's memory. Uh, you're representing it like it's on a desktop, but it's not really on a desktop. Uh, and so you can move things like you would move them in real space. Uh, and so what that means is that when these things uh, are replaced uh, by different metaphors, it changes the way in which you might interact uh, with a computer. A computer is now much more interactive and useful if you can treat it like you would treat everything else, like a notebook or like uh, playing a game on a desktop or a tabletop. Uh, other metaphors like cloud computing uh, have changed that even more. The last example I wanted to give is the idea of serendipity. And this is the idea of uh, sort of a fortunate or a convenient accidental discovery. Most people are familiar with the idea of Alexander Fleming uh, discovering penicillin, which is uh, a bacteria uh, or sorry, a mold uh, or a fungus that can destroy bacteria, uh, which allows for any, essentially all of the modern antibiotics uh, to work the way that uh, 
the way that they do. But the original discovery or the apocryphal discovery uh, is leaving some sort of bacteria and noticing that a mold had grown on it and killed the bacteria around it. So without intending, uh, Fleming discovered that this particular mold could destroy the bacteria. Uh, once that was able to be recreated, uh, the idea of antibiotics were able to be introduced. It's an accident in the sense that it wasn't necessarily designed uh, to have that outcome. Um, but what I've suggested here is that these kinds of happy accidents do require some attention to detail and do require someone to notice them, right? Uh, and to be able to uh, realize the importance of that. If you weren't studying bacteria and molds, uh, you might not have the ability for that happy accident uh, to occur. A few other things I want to briefly discuss, uh, and this has to do a lot with if you're interested in uh, marketing or if you're interested in, in uh, creating new uh, products, uh, product discovery, or those kind of innovation industries. I'm going to go through these really quickly because I don't want to uh, fall short on time. Uh, but these are all ideas that are around how to foster creativity. And one of them uh, is the idea of a creative paradigm. A creative paradigm is a way of thinking uh, that seems to encourage people to come up with more ideas. And it means that many people are thinking about things in the same way. Uh, this happens often in innovation or product uh, development when a new way to interact with a device or a new way to create or sell a device uh, is becomes common. Uh, and many other companies might develop versions of that in order to come up with new creative things. You've probably seen this over the last five years uh, in five years, for example, how much have you noticed that your experience with Instagram, for example, uh, has changed to make it be a lot like your experience with TikTok uh, or your experience with Snapchat before that? Uh, so as new ways to interact with social platforms come online, uh, lots of different uh, companies might introduce uh, some of the same features that seem useful. And then someone else will come up with some new feature, uh, which if it's enough to change the way in which people interact with the option, with the service, uh, it changes the paradigm. One of the best examples that I think most of us are familiar with is uh, any of the mobile phones, uh, smartphones, or wireless phones that we have. Uh, most of us take it for granted. Uh, you take it for granted that it can do a lot of things, right? It takes photographs. Uh, you can communicate, you've got all of the internet uh, at your fingers uh, and pretty much do anything that your laptop can do, right? If you need to, uh, you could write a whole paper on your smartphone. You wouldn't like it, but you could do it, right? So you know you can do a lot of things on your smartphone. Um, all of this is about a 20-year span of uh, product development, but really uh, a lot of this has only happened in the last 15 years. Uh, most phones didn't have cameras prior to that. Most phones didn't have access to the internet or GPS uh, or messaging. This is what phones looked like uh, maybe 30 years ago. I've talked about the danger of operating your smartphone while you're driving. The irony is uh, they were advertised to be used in cars originally. Uh, so most people, and these are much older, uh, you know, these are from the 1980s. Uh, this is from 1984. Uh, so 1984, uh, mobile phones were designed and marketed specifically to be used in automobiles. The idea was you're driving along, you can talk, why not talk to somebody who's in the office? Can your secretary take dictation at 55 miles an hour? It's a little bit dated and sexist. Here's the executive driving along, blasting along in his station wagon uh, and issuing orders uh, to his uh, secretary. Because when I say it's sexist, your secretary has a hard time keeping up with, wait until she hears about this. Um, and so that's, that's him uh, blasting along. Here's the happy guy stuck in traffic on his device, happily using it. Here's everyone unhappy uh, not using their mobile device. Uh, so that's the irony is that most of these things were originally designed to be used while you're driving. And ever since then, uh, we've been struggling to figure out ways to not get people to use them. Uh, while they're driving, partially because they could only be used for voice uh, 40, 50 years, 20 or 30 years ago. 
We've got 20 more minutes. Let's try to get through some of this as much as we can. Uh, and then I can always tack a little bit of this on to uh, the lecture on uh, next week. Is that okay? Uh, so we're gonna go to 1215. Can you make it to 1215? Let's make it to 1215. So what counts as a creative contribution? We've talked about how to foster creativity. We've talked about the steps of creativity, uh, but we haven't talked about what counts as a creative contribution. Uh, is it creative, for example, when Instagram rolls out a new feature that looks exactly like TikTok? Maybe not. Maybe it's just copying something. Uh, maybe that's not very creative. That's part of a creative paradigm, but maybe the feature itself isn't very creative. So what would count as creative? I do want to talk about this because this is going to lead us into next week's lecture on expertise. Um, creative contributions might be distinguished by three things, novelty, quality, and regularity. So if you're in a creative industry, whether it's investing, product design, uh, music composition, uh, recording arts, uh, visual arts, anything that requires creating new things. Uh, these are three things that might distinguish creativity from non-creativity. And the first is novelty, new things. Uh, new features or new ways to present visual information or new ways uh, to present um, uh, textual information. Quality might mean things that are useful and high quality as rated by experts, peers in the marketplace. So new for new sake isn't necessarily creative. Uh, it might just be new, right? It is important to be new, but it has to be new and useful new and good, or new and high quality. Uh, and if it's a creative company or a creative individual, you might want to do this on a regular basis. If you've had one great first album or one great first song, that might be great. But if you can't follow that up, uh, then perhaps maybe there's a lack of creativity. Uh, scientists might fall into this. You might have some really good ideas uh, and then just keep using the same idea over and over again. Uh, writers could fall into this. Maybe you write one really good novel and then everything kind of falls off uh, after that. So all three of these would be important to some degree uh, to measure uh, creative contributions. Does that seem straightforward so far? All right, let's try to get as far as we can into the study of creativity, and we'll stop at 1215. So the study of creativity is going to talk about several different ways to measure or study creativity. Uh, we can talk about measuring people's general intelligence, but that isn't enough. We can talk about measuring people's working memory capacity, but that might not be enough. So most measures of creativity or most studies of creativity involve things around these ideas of novelty, regularity, and high quality. Uh, some of the things we've talked about for what counts as a creative contribution, we can try to come up with laboratory tasks uh, to study and measure. Um, most early uh, philosophical or psychological attempts just kind of dismissed creativity as being something that might come from outside. And you can certainly imagine how in a non-scientific approach, this seems reasonable. We've already described insight, problem solving, as something that seems to arise suddenly. If the solution arises suddenly and you feel good when, it's, when you solve a problem, you can imagine that it's possible to interpret that uh, as an otherworldly or outside influence, right? Suddenly the idea just takes hold. But that could be something that isn't internal, but rather external. Uh, it's really difficult to study this scientifically. Um, and so most... Uh, cognitive or social or developmental psychologists have studied this uh, by taking one or two th one or two different approaches. One might be a pragmatic approach, uh, and this might be along the lines of those uh, serendipity sensitivity uh, examples that we gave. So maybe we can't measure creativity very well, or we don't know exactly what causes it psychologically, but we can foster it. Remember back to the mutilated checkerboard example, uh, Simon and uh, colleagues discovered that there were certain configurations of that problem which were easier to solve. So maybe we can present information in such a way that it allows people to generate more ideas. Maybe we can encourage people to be creative. Um, about 10 years ago, uh, 10, 15 years ago, maybe about 10 years ago, there was a lot of interest 
in the psychological field in whether or not certain kinds of games or activities could make people more creative. Maybe some of you remember these kinds of things or you've seen advertisements for them. Uh, games like Lumosity, for example, which was a, an interactive service. You could pay for it. Uh, and you were supposed to be able to do these games and it would encourage uh, creativity and general intelligence. It's kind of mixed evidence for this, uh, enough mixed to suggest that they don't do very much. <laughs> uh, they might help some people, they might not help other people. Uh, and so you might see directly contradictory uh, results in high profile journals, improving fluid intelligence. Working memory may increase working memory, but not fluid intelligence. So published at roughly uh, a few years apart, uh, studies uh, sort of suggesting exactly the opposite. Brain training games may ex boost executive functions and working memory uh, and speed, uh, but maybe not uh, fluid intelligence. You might see examples of uh, certain kinds of games that require you to visualize things in three dimensions uh, might help uh, certain kinds of cognitive skills, but not others. So there's mixed evidence that any one of these uh, will encourage creativity. Uh, any more so or any less so than anything else that you might engage in. Uh, you can engage in problem solving in lots of ways and you get better at problem solving, but maybe not better uh, at creativity or insight. You can play connections all year long and you won't necessarily get any more creative. You might just get a little bit better at connections. Why? Because you've probably figured out the connections tricks, right? Some of the obvious heuristics that let you know what kind of connections it is. How many of you play connections or have before? So you know what I'm talking about, the connections tricks, right? Uh, there's always, you can figure out that there's one thing that has two meanings, and then you see if there are four others of it. And if there aren't, then you know it's one of the, it's one of the false starts or it's one of the tricks. I mean, there are some of these things. So knowing that we, we can only have some limited success trying to encourage creativity with different kinds of acts, maybe we can try to measure creativity. Um, measurement of creativity seems to be a little bit more straightforward. So we have, psychologists have been able to develop relatively well standardized tests that seem to be able to distinguish between at least some kinds of creativity. Uh, uh, J.P. Guilford calls these convergent and divergent thinking, and that these are cognitive styles or approaches to thinking that correlate with creativity. Convergent thinking means taking disparate ideas and converging on what's common. Connections, for example, would be an example of convergent thinking. You have to have four different words that are held together by one convergent idea. Divergent thinking would be taking two different things or taking one thing and splitting off into multiple possible uh, avenues. So problem solving or insight uh, approach. Both of these are important for creativity. So Guilford in the 1960s uh, developed a series of tests and a way to score those tests uh, and then asked a lot of people to take these tests. Uh, so that there could be some kind of norm. Uh, and to the degree that tests correlate with each other and correlate with other measures of general intelligence, fluid intelligence, uh, verbal intelligence, so on, we can get an idea of what seems to be uh, required for a creativity test. Here's some examples. Uh, you might be uh, given the plot of a story and asked to write original titles. Uh, so those can be clever or not clever, right? Um, you can be doing a quick response in a word association task, and you might score it for how uncommon those words are. The more uncommon those words are, the more creative or the more uh, divergent it suggests your thinking is. Uh, figure concepts. I'll show you some examples of those in the next few slides. Uh, figure, participants are given simple drawings of objects, and individuals are and asked to find qualities that are common to two or more drawings, and you can score them for uncommonness. Here's one that comes up a lot actually is the unusual uses test where you might be given a common object and asked to come up with as many possible unusual uses for it as you can think of. And you might score those then for how many different things do you say and how unusual are those uses. Remote associates. This is another one that's really common because it's easy to administer. Uh, this is essentially your connections example, where participants are asked to find a word between two given words. So you're given some things that are uh, not in common and you're asked to converge 
uh, on, a, on the same answer. Um, remote consequences, where participants are asked to generate a list of consequences and unexpected events, like what happens if gravity disappears on Earth? What are all of the things that might happen? Uh, and then you might score those for the number of answers given, the number of words given, and the statistical rarity of those things. Another variant of this are referred to as Torrance tests, uh, and uh, these are based on some of Guilford's work. These are some different variants, asking questions, uh, write out questions based on a drawing of a scene, uh, list ways to change a toy monkey so that children will have more fun playing with it, uh, list interesting and unusual uses of a cardboard dot box, expand empty circles into different drawings. What all of these have in common is that they're, they're taking something straightforward, either one object, like a circle, and then asking you to come up with many possible versions of it. Or they're asking you to take several things and come up with the thing that's in common. That's convergent thinking versus divergent thinking. Let me take you through a few examples, and then I think we'll be very close to where we need to be at the end. Thanks for your patience, by the way. I realize this is a long lecture period uh, on a rainy Tuesday morning uh, at the end of March. So I really appreciate that you're all here, by the way. I just wanted to say that. It really makes me uh, pleased that you're still here. Uh, so any of these tests, um, I don't say that enough. I don't say that enough. Thank you for uh, sticking with this lecture. Um, these can be scored for fluency. Uh, in other words, the total number of relevant responses. I mean, if you only give one response to something like unusual uses for a cardboard box, a box you know, to put things in, that's not a lot of answers, right? But if you give 20 different answers, then that's more fluent. Flexibility, the number of different categories. So when you're scoring these, you can say, well, cardboard box, everything they mentioned was something to put something in. They gave me a lot of different answers, but they all kind of boiled down to putting something in, as opposed to maybe tearing the box apart and using it for something else. That would be a different category of things. So the number of different categories uh, suggests the flexibility of your thinking. The originality, how common are these responses? If someone says, oh, a cardboard box, I could use that to start a fire. That's fairly common, right? So that might not be very rare. Elaboration, the amount of detail. If you say, well, I would take the cardboard box and then I would split it up so that it was uh, unfolded into the longest possible configuration. And then this is what I would do when we were kids, by the way. Anytime a large box showed up, like a refrigerator sized box, you would unfold it and then put it on a hill and slide down the box like a slip and slide. Anybody ever done this? Or is this something that people only did down in the woods where I grew up in the holler? Uh, we didn't have any. We didn't have any playgrounds, so we had to unfold cardboard boxes and slide down them. This is what we did. We unfolded the cardboard box and we try to slide down the cardboard box because we didn't have TV back in those days or whatever. Uh, so the amount of detail given. Um, your remote associates task. This is a task of um, convergent thinking. So uh, in these examples, this is very much like your connections example. Uh, we can ask people to come up with the one thing that's common to all of these, and we can, add, we can measure how quickly they can come up with that and whether or not they're correct or not. So a uh, bank, for example, you can have a river bank, a bank note, and a blood bank. Um, you can have uh, a billboard, a duck bill, and a dollar bill. So there's one word that's in common with all of them. And the ability to solve some of these uh, reflects your convergent thinking uh, ability. Some of these are hard, and some of these are easier. Circles task. Uh, here's a quick example of a circles task. Suppose I give you a lot of circles, and I say draw as many things with these circles as possible. Uh, and then we ask people to, we give people responses. So they're given some circles. This is a, a low scoring answer here um, because they drew a sun, a clock, and a face. Not too creative. I mean, that seems like the most common thing and they're all the same shape. Uh, here is a high scoring, here are some higher scoring answers like a button, um, a hamburger. Uh, here's a, a gentleman eating a banana in exactly the worst way possible. Uh, still taking the same circle as the um, as the starting point. And so what you can see is that you can score these based on statistical regularity. Lots of people probably draw a sun when they see the circle, but probably nobody 
uh, draws two cats with their tails tangled together with little hearts coming off of them, right? So those might be more creative. I think we can all see why one is more creative than the other. One is more regular, one is more common, has less detail. The other one has more detail, is statistically less common, and is further removed from just the circle shapes. Um, this was just another example of creative and less creative uh, examples. I wanna talk just briefly before we go uh, about a few other things and how these tasks might be used. You probably remember that we used the remote associates task, by the way, in the ambient noise study that we did in my lab a few years ago, where we asked people to uh, sit in low, medium, and high ambient noise scenarios, and we asked them to complete a remote associate task. Um, it turns out that lots of other things have shown, uh, lots of other studies have looked at creativity in different scenarios. For example, um, Alice Eisen and Kim Dobman showed uh, that uh, being put in a good mood allows people to solve more of these remote associate tasks. So we don't need to go into great detail of the actual methods here, but essentially they were shown uh, happy movies and given a candle box task. And people in the good mood were able to solve the candle box task more easily. In a second study, um, so after the uh, positive film, more people solved it uh, than in the neutral film or in the no manipulation. Uh, in a second study, uh, they were given positive mood scenarios in which the positive mood people uh, were given a very small decorated bag of candy, 10 pieces of wrapped hard candy and a glad fun time sandwich bag. Very specific. I remember working briefly with uh, the author here, Alice Eisen on some other research and they had worked very, for a very long time to get exactly this manipulation. Any more than 10 and it seems gratuitous. Any less than 10 and it doesn't put you in a good mood. And it has to be hard candy and not chocolate because most people find hard candy to be okay, but not exactly like really a big gift, right? It's just like four, like 10 lifesavers or something like that. Like it's okay, but you go into a study. How many of you have been to a lab in a study and they don't give you any candy? Most of them are like that, right? But if you came in and before you did the study, they gave you a not too fancy, but nice looking uh, glad fun time sandwich bags were glad sandwich bags that had little fun designs on them. So it's more than just a plain bag. It's a bag with like little trees drawn on it or something. So you get a little fun bag with some color and 10 pieces of candy. Thanks for being in our study. Here's some candy for you. Now we're gonna ask you to do something. People were in a happy mood, not like a static mood and not like a distracted happy mood, but just, oh, that was kind of nice of them to give me for this little candy. Does that still work if the participant knows they're being manipulated? It shouldn't make any difference if they know they're being manipulated. Uh, it would be an experimenter effect. Uh, and so what they can ask afterwards is they can test people's, uh, what, what they would typically do is they would ask people, uh, did you associate the candy uh, with being asked to be in a positive mood? And most people say they don't. Uh, it's just part of the experiment itself. Uh, and so it puts people in a good mood. You can measure them with a, what's called a PANA scale, positive affective, negative, positive and negative affect scale. Uh, which gives people sort of a, gives you a regular measure of mood. And it does put people in a good mood, but most people don't know. I think the effects would still work even if they knew they were being asked to be in a good mood, as long as they are uh, authentically uh, in a good mood. Does that make sense? Um, and what they found is that when they ask them to then solve remote associate tasks, the candy conditions solved more, uh, more easily. Um, final study I'll tell you about, and I'm, amazingly, we are going to finish today's lecture on time. I can't believe it. It actually worked. The, the, we're, we're at the point now where the lake is half full uh, and it's about ready to be filled. Um, and this is just to suggest that just like the video game studies that I was talked about, talking about a lot of this creativity research, you should interpret it with caution. That was a good question you asked because in a lot of these cases, uh, there are alternative explanations. Yes, maybe being given a bag of candy puts you in a good mood and the good mood makes you solve more problems. Or maybe being given a bag of candy makes you think that you should be a better subject uh, and therefore you should solve more things. Both are possible. Um, and this study uh, suggests, well, this study will suggest some creative and uh, interesting uh, aspects to remote associate problem solving, but then suggest that maybe these kinds of results are not likely to be stable. 
Um, this paper came about about 10, a little about 12 years ago, um, right before the time that psychology started wrestling with what they called the reproducibility or replicability crisis, meaning that lots of results, especially in social psychology, turned out to be very difficult to replicate. Not because social psychology has a problem per se, but just sometimes the manipulations were hard to hard to standardize. Uh, and so sometimes measurement uh, was, uh, was difficult. And sometimes the tasks and the interventions themselves were hard to um, keep standardized. And that meant that some of these results might be interesting, but might be difficult to replicate. And if they're difficult to replicate, you don't know if the first result was stable. Here's such an example. Um, embodied metaphors and creative acts. Uh, let me just sort of take you through a couple of details, but Here's one, um, 102 undergraduate students uh, participated in this study in return for $7. Using PVC pipe and cardboard, we constructed a box that measured five by five that could comfortably seat one individual. So you know what PVC pipe is, right? So you've got a pipe cardboard box. It would be just big enough for people to sit in. We placed the box in a laboratory and asked participants who had been told the study concerned the effects of different work environments to complete a 10 item RAT test. So 10 item tasks, there's only 10 of those uh, items that I showed you. So that's not a very, not a lot of items. Um, while sitting either inside or outside the box. And so their thought was that if thinking outside the box is creative, and then you step literally outside of the box, you might solve more of these problems. But if you are seated inside the box while you create, while you solve these 10 problems, you will not solve as many. Uh, and that by acting out a creativity metaphor, which most of us associate with something Steve Jobs of Apple says, thinking outside the box, if you literally are asked to physically think outside the box, you might solve more problems. And that's what they found. <laughs> uh, what they found was that, predict as predicted, participants who pleased the RAT while they were physically outside the box generated more correct answers. And the important thing I want you to notice is the mean and standard deviation seven to five. So in other words, people thinking outside the box solved one more problem. Uh, so of those 50 people who sat outside the box, either they all solved one more problem or a handful of them maybe solved two problems uh, more. So it's not a very, it's a significant result statistically, um, but not very much. This is a fairly small effect size, as you can see here. Um, these are not large effects. Uh, and so the important here is uh, psychologists a few years later started looking at results like this, suggesting that I don't know about this. I don't know about these results. This Maybe this happened. We're not suggesting that there was any uh, fraudulent motives here, but that perhaps maybe it's such a small effect that would it replicate? Uh, the answer for a lot of these seems to be no. Um, in fact, a study later uh, in Psychonomic Bulletin and Review in 2014 looked at all of the studies that were published in this issue, the 2012 issue of psychological science and calculated a statistic. It's called the P, uh, the TES uh, statistic, which is a, a measure of how likely that result is to be reproduced based on the, its, uh, its effect size. Uh, and this particular one, embed, embodied metaphors and creative uh, acts was sort of in this top 10 uh, list. Uh, in other words, most many of these studies turned out to not be able to rep, not be replicable mostly because the effect sizes were small, mostly because uh, controls weren't taken, and often because the results themselves are kind of unbelievable. I mean, that's the other thing, is that there's no clear mechanism for how standing outside of a physical box would guarantee that you could solve one extra remote associates uh, task problem. So what I wanna say here is, like everything else, interpret some of this stuff with caution, especially if it seems like something that is just too clever, uh, then it's likely to be something you wanna look carefully at. Clever is good sometimes, but it can also be a good heuristic uh, to suggest that maybe you just wanna take a closer look. It doesn't mean it's bad, just take a closer look. So 
Um, you'll have this in your slides. Uh, you don't need to necessarily do the screenshot now, but you can. Uh, if there was anything about today's class that doesn't seem clear and you'd like me to spend just a few minutes talking about next week, answer this survey. And just like I did last week, I'll send this list around. Uh, and if I get some consistent answers, I'll spend some time talking about them. Uh, good luck on quiz four today. And I'll see all of you back here for one last class uh, before final exams. Have a good week, everyone. No, it gets worse.